Burlington Humane, the podcast of the Burlington Humane Society, Ontario's premier no-kill shelter. Bye, society. Bye, society. Burlington Humane is my society. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Burlington Humane, the podcast of the Burlington Humane Society. My name is Doug, and I'm coming to you from beautiful Burlington, Ontario, Canada. On this episode of Burlington Humane, we're going to learn about the latest findings with dogs and COVID-19. We'll learn what to do about dogs jumping up with Jen Merritt, president of Burlington Humane. And we'll hear about a couple of new bills that were introduced into Parliament and at Queen's Park that extend more rights for animals. So stay with us for this and much more on Burlington Humane. A dog in Niagara has tested positive for COVID-19. What does that mean? In a blog post by Dr. Scott Weiss, a veterinarian at the Ontario Veterinary College, University of Guelph, Center for Public Health and Zoonosis, he cites several studies related to dogs and COVID-19. Several studies have shown that dogs can be infected with the COVID-19 virus, yet not get sick. Some dogs have even developed antibodies for the virus, which indicate that they were truly infected and their immune system acted accordingly. They did not pass the virus to other dogs that they lived with. In the end, some or all of the exposed dogs got infected, but none got sick, and they didn't infect any other dogs. We really don't know how much human-to-dog transmission there is. There's also doubt whether dogs can transmit the virus to people or other wildlife. Here in Canada, we have found the first identified COVID-19 positive dog. The dog is an adult dog in the Niagara region of Ontario. Four of six people in the household had COVID-19. There were two dogs living in the household and both dogs were healthy at the time of sampling and hadn't had any obvious signs of disease. What does that mean to the family members? Well, nothing. The people in the household were all infected, and there was almost certainly human-to-human transition. The dogs were infected by the owners, and at that point didn't pose any risk to already infected people. What about other risks? The potential risk for pets is if they have contact with other people or animals outside the household, such as going to parks, kennels, or veterinary clinics. There is currently not enough evidence to know if dogs shed enough of the virus to infect others. The assumption is that dogs are low risk for being infectious. However, we certainly can't say there is no risk from contact with an infected dog. There's also a plausible risk of transmitting the virus to neighbors through the fence, something that had been seen with other infections like canine influenza and para-influenza. So pets need to consider part of the household in terms of COVID-19 precautions. If people are being isolated, do the same with pets. It doesn't matter if a dog or cat is infected if they don't encounter anyone new. It is not recommended that people with COVID-19 get their pets tested outside of organized surveillance studies. Don't be afraid of animals in terms of COVID-19, but use common sense. If you are infected with COVID-19, limit your contact with anything with a pulse, not just people. If your household is isolating because of COVID-19 exposure, make sure it includes the whole household. Don't let your dog lick your neighbor through the fence, and don't let your dog do the same to the neighbor's dog or kids. So what should be done with dogs and cats? 
If you are infected, try to stay away from animals. All animals, human and otherwise. <clears throat> if your dog has been exposed, keep it inside and away from others. Ultimately, dogs are part of the family. So if your family is being isolated, the cat or dog needs to be part of that. And relax. This is almost exclusively a human virus. So the risk posed from pets approaches zero. You can now support Burlington Humane when you make purchases from Amazon. If you head to our website, you will see a link on our homepage and on our wishlist page that will take you directly to Amazon's website. Every time you make a purchase on Amazon by accessing their site through Burlington Humane's link, we receive a small compensation from Amazon. You don't pay any more, but the animals will benefit. So make your Amazon purchases count by going to Amazon through the link on burlingtonhumane.ca. The more you shop, the more you help the animals at Burlington Humane. You can also purchase items from the Amazon website and have them delivered directly to BHS. During checkout, enter our address as the delivery location, 740 Griffith Court, Burlington, Ontario, L7L, 5R9. Search Amazon wishlist Burlington Humane Society for items that we are in need of. We appreciate all purchases and donations. Thank you from Burlington Humane. problem pet owners have with their pet dogs is their dogs jumping up on people. Burlington Humane's president, Jen Merritt, is also a certified dog trainer. She stopped by to give us some valuable tips on how to work on this issue. I'm here with Jen Merritt. Jen is the president of Burlington Humane and she's also a certified dog trainer. Welcome Jen to Burlington Humane. Hi Doug. So one of the problems that we have at the shelter and I'm sure many people have with their dogs is that they jump up. How do we help the dogs with that? So dogs jump up on people for a variety of reasons. Uh, including excitement and attention seeking. And dogs develop behavior patterns of jumping up because the consequence of the behavior are rewarding in some way to them. So even if each time your dog jumps up, you yell and push them away, for many yeah. dogs, this is enough for the jumping up behavior to become stronger and stronger. And that's what we usually do. If the dog jumps up, we push it down, off, off, down. So that can be enough of a incentive and reward for dogs to become serial offenders oh, of so, jumping up. So they actually think that we're praising them and wanting them to do it more. And sometimes even, even negative attention is attention. Oh, yeah. okay. So they're getting some sort of attention. Right. Whether they realize that it's good or bad, it's still attention. So for a true behavior change in jumping up, we need to use a combination of changing the consequence, rewarding an alternate behavior, and management. It's important to understand that when we work on changing a behavior, any behavior, we need to evaluate how long the behavior's been going on because it's gonna be easier to change a behavior that's been going on for days or weeks versus something that's been going on for months and years. You know, and that's a problem we have at the shelter. If we have a dog that comes in to Burlington Humane, we have no idea how long it's been jumping up. These are some strategies to help resolve a dog's jumping up behavior. Okay, so then what does it mean to 
only reward the positive behavior. If they jump up, they've already committed the offense. How do we get them down without rewarding them inadvertently? So uh, we, we change the consequence, and that's an easy thing you can do to help your dog change their jumping up behavior, is that you stop reacting to it. When your dog jumps up, instead of yelling or pushing them away, cross your arms and become a tree. Don't look at them, walk away. And everyone that interacts with the dog must follow this rule as well. Your dog does not understand that it's okay to jump up on one person, but not another. Okay, and we, at our kids club, we teach the kids that, be a tree. Be a tree. Yeah, tucking your branches, stand still like a tree, and then when the dog sees, oh, well, you're boring, you're not playing, you're not reacting, they go and find someone else. So, at the same time, we also want to teach an alternate behavior. So think about what your dog can do for you instead of jumping up. Sitting is a great alternative. Um, and it's important that sitting is rewarded constantly and generously. If you see your dog coming towards you and you know that jumping up is likely, before they get to you, cue them to sit and reward them with something that they find meaningful. Oh, okay. So that, that could be sense. attention, you could throw a toy for them, you could feed them a treat. It's whatever they're going to like. Uh, the alternate behavior should be the thing that gets your dog the most attention day in and day out. Oh, wow. So you've got to be watching and ready. And <laughs> yeah. third way that we can help our dogs is through management. So this is perhaps the most important strategy. And management involves setting up the environment to decrease the likelihood that the behavior is going to happen. So this could include using a, a crate or a barrier or some, a baby gate to keep your dog from jumping up. Uh, if the sound of the doorbell is a catalyst for your canine cyclone, make sure your dog is behind the barrier or in their crate prior to a guest's arrival. Allow your dog a few minutes to calm down, mm -hmm. attach a leash onto their collar, and then permit them to greet the visitors. And I guess, too, you have to let the visitors know, oh, if he jumps up, be a tree. So it has to be the same set of rules for the visitors as for family members. Jumping up does not equal attention, cue for sits, and big rewards for sitting. Wow, so the whole community needs to be involved in the training of the dog. It takes a village. Yeah, <laughs> so that there's consistency. Exactly. That's the key, I guess, eh? Consistency. It is. And the, one, the last thing we have to be aware of is a common training phenomenon called extinction burst. Oh. So when a behavior that has routinely been rewarded, such as jumping up, uh, suddenly stops working for the dog, they will do it more. Oh. This is temporary, and it's a sign that the jumping up is on its way to be extinguished. So they're almost getting frantic. So, <laughs> it's like if you went to a vending machine, and you put your quarter in, yeah. and all of a sudden nothing came out. Oh. What would you do? Oh, press the button oh, even more. Oh, <laughs> definitely, right? You'd be like, well, this just... Why isn't this working? You bang on it. <laughs> this always works for me, right? So what you can expect is that the dog may become a little bit a little bit frustrated okay. and actually jump up a little bit more, but be positive, be consistent and make the process enjoyable for you and your dog and you're on your way to extinguishing jumping up. Wow, it makes so much sense. I guess you got to think like a dog. It helps. But really, when you give that example of the vending machine, we already do think like a dog. We react the same way. We do. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Well, what great advice. Thank you so much, Jen. Oh, you're and welcome. hopefully we'll all have really well-behaved dogs. Of course we will. Great. Thanks so much for joining us here on Burlington Humane. Thanks, Doug. Bye-bye.
She's there for you when work is stressful. She's there for you when life is hard. She's there for you when you need a friend. Be there for her. Register for Pet First Aid today. The next course is on February 7th here at Burlington Humane. been a couple of new bills introduced in Parliament and Queen's Park. The Jane Goodall Act and the proposed Teddy's Law. Let's learn more about them. A new bill has been introduced in Parliament called the Jane Goodall Act. It was introduced by Senator Murray Sinclair on November 17th. CBC's political correspondent, John Tasker, shared the following story. World-renowned primatologist Jane Goodall is joining forces with Manitoba Senator Murray Sinclair to press Canada to adopt a more ambitious animal welfare law that would effectively ban keeping great apes and elephants in captivity in Canada. Sinclair introduced a bill in the Senate that would ban zoos and other establishments from acquiring new great apes or elephants unless they're doing so for welfare or conservation purposes. The legislation entitled the Jane Goodall Act, also would ban the use of the two species for entertainment, including elephant rides. There are 33 great apes in captivity in Canada, 9 chimpanzees, 18 gorillas, and 6 orangutans, according to figures compiled by Sinclair. More than 20 elephants live in captivity in Canada. 16 of them are at the Ontario-based African Lion Safari, the largest herd in any North American zoological facility. The tourist attraction, which bills itself as Canada's original safari adventure, uses some of its Asian elephants for entertainment and to ferry people around the 750-acre property. One of African Lion Safari's elephants attacked a trainer last year, leaving him with non-life-threatening injuries. World Animal Protection compared programs at zoos around the world with the guidelines set out by the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums and found that dozens of international zoos, including African Lion Safari in Hamilton and Jungle Cat World in Orono, Ontario, don't comply with the World Association for Zoos and Aquarium rules. African Lion Safari, the reports noted, offers guests the chance to ride elephants, while Jungle Cat World, which is not affiliated with the International Zoo Association or its Canadian counterpart, lets visitors get close to wildcats for selfies. The bill would amend the criminal code to make it a federal offense to own a great ape or an elephant, or to breed these animals with some limited exceptions for those pursuing non-harmful scientific research and for cases where an animal's welfare is in question. <clears throat> Zoos and other places would be able to keep their current stock of these animals. The bill also would amend existing federal wild animal protection laws to create a licensing regime for those looking to import these animals or move them across provincial borders. Sinclair's bill also would close a gap in existing legislation that allows for the importation of elephant ivory and hunting trophies. The bill would forbid the importing and exporting of any items composed of elephant ivory and items consisting of any elephant parts, with some very limited exceptions. The government currently bans the sale of ivory from elephants killed after 1990, but ivory is difficult to date 
and illegal supplies easily enter the Canadian market, Sinclair said. In 1930, as many as 10 million elephants inhabited Africa. Today, there are only some 400,000 left. This dramatic decline, Goodall says, is due to ivory poaching. She and other countries, such as China and the United Kingdom, already have banned the trade in ivory, and Canada, as a purposefully civilized democratic country, should follow suit by passing Sinclair's bill. Sinclair ushered through a similar piece of legislation last year that banned whale and dolphin captivity at parks like Marineland in Niagara Falls, Ontario. He said he's determined to save wildlife because of his grounding in traditional Indigenous knowledge about the role animals play in a well-functioning society. Beyond the criminal code changes and new licensing provisions for great apes and elephants, Sinclair's bill also would, through regulatory changes, give Ottawa the power to crack down on the private possession of big cats such as lions and tigers. Hundreds of these cats are being held in captivity in Canada. The proposed legislation builds on Canada's 2019 laws phasing out whale and dolphin captivity for entertainment. The Jane Goodall Act would ban new captivity of great apes and elephants unless licensed for their best interest, including individual welfare and conservation or non-harmful scientific research. It would ban the use of great apes and elephants in performance, including elephant rides. It would establish legal standing for great apes, elephants, whales and dolphins in sentencing for captivity offenses, allowing court orders for relocation or improved conditions. It would empower government to extend all the protections to other species of captive, non-domesticated animals such as big cats. And it would ban the import of elephant ivory and hunting trophies. Let's hope this bill passes to make Canada a more humane country for all animals. In December, Davenport, Member of Provincial Parliament, Merritt Stiles, has tabled a new bill in the Ontario Legislature that would amend animal welfare laws to ban the decline of cats in Ontario. In Canada, decline is only illegal in two provinces, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. However, it has been banned by several provincial veterinary associations across the country, including groups in Manitoba, New Brunswick, British Columbia, and Alberta. Declawing is already banned in several countries, including England, Scotland, Wales, Italy, France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Norway, Sweden, Netherlands, Northern Ireland, Ireland, Denmark, Finland, Slovenia, Portugal, Belgium, Spain, Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand. Stiles said that cats are our cherished companions and are often treated as members of the family, but the practice of decline can cause lifelong pain and discomfort. Veterinarians and advocates have been drawing attention to this issue for years, and with better alternatives available, it's long past time Ontario moved to ban this harmful and unnecessary practice. Unlike simply cutting a human's nails, Partial digital amputation, or decline, removes the entire lower third phalanx bone in a cat's paws, resulting in pain, discomfort, and behavioral changes in cats. While a pet owner may be trying to protect furniture from scratching, the consequences of decline often result in more disruptive behaviors like biting and marking. Both the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association and the Ontario Veterinary Medical Association have said that non-therapeutic partial digital amputation is ethically unacceptable without comprehensive education for pet owners about the impacts. A growing number of veterinarians refuse to perform the surgery at all. 
Veterinarian Dr. Kelly in St. Denis, Quebec says, This legislation is long past due. While many veterinarians have made the ethical choice to stop decline, we need legislation to put an end to this practice in Ontario once and for all. This is a critical step in advancing the welfare of our domestic cats. Michel Grulot, Canadian Veterinary Medical Association Animal Welfare Committee, says the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association views non-therapeutic decline as ethically unacceptable as the surgery has the potential to cause unnecessary and unavoidable pain. Dr. Carol Matthews, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Guelph, says, As a veterinarian, I've witnessed the lifelong pain and suffering that this non-therapeutic procedure can result in. It's time to end this cruel practice as non-pain-inflicted methods exist to allow for normal cat behavior. Teddy's Law, named after the declawed cat of Paw Project founder and veterinarian Geet Fender, would ban the practice outright in Ontario, except when deemed medically necessary by a veterinarian for reasons such as trauma or specific diseases. For many years, the Paw Project has been working with the public, policymakers, and veterinarians to educate about the painful and crippling effects of feline decline. To promote animal welfare and to end declaw surgery in jurisdictions around the world, said Finger. This legislation will bring Ontario in line with other provinces as leaders in animal welfare. It's about time we got this done. Teddy would be proud. And now, it's time for news and events. In response to the COVID-19 advisories, we have restricted our access to Burlington Humane by the general public. Guests are no longer able to drop into Burlington Humane unannounced. Access to our shelter is now by appointment only. We are trying to limit access to keep everyone safe. We have changed the way we are doing things at Burlington Humane. We have reduced our hours at Burlington Humane. Our hours are now Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Be sure to stay informed about all the animals that are available for adoption. We are currently featuring daily videos of our available animals. We are also doing virtual room tours of our animal rooms. Be sure to subscribe to our social media pages to watch these videos. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Videos of our animals can also be found on our website at www.burlingtonhumane.ca. Stay informed and up to date with Burlington Humane. These are challenging times for Canadian charities, including Burlington Humane Society. As you can imagine, we have been hit hard during this crisis. We rely completely on donations, but unfortunately they have been down the last few months. We have also had to cancel all of our fundraising events due to the crown and physical distancing restrictions. If you are able to make a financial donation, it would be greatly appreciated. Any and all donations are a big help and will ensure that we continue support and operation of Burlington Humane. Burlington Humane Kids Club is back in virtual format. Children between the ages of 8 and 12 We'll learn about cats and dogs and how to take care of them. Plus, we will have guest speakers from the animal welfare field. Go to our website to register. BurlingtonHumane.ca And join Burlington Humane Kids Club. Our secondhand stores, The Loft and The Attic, are temporarily closed. The Loft is located at our shelter and The Attic is located in downtown Burlington on John Street. 
Because they are closed, we ask people not to bring donations for the store, and please do not leave them outside. We do not have anyone there at to accept them or process them. We will let you know when the loft and attic resume operations. We've had some notable adoptions lately. One of them is Faithful. Faithful was one of our senior cats who was abandoned here at the shelter last March. Faithful had irritable bowel syndrome, liver disease, arthritis, and needed monthly B12 injections. She was here for over eight months and had previously been overlooked by potential adopters due to her being over 10 years of age. Faithful was finally adopted by a wonderful team at a veterinary clinic. This is the perfect place for Faithful as they will ensure she is comfortable during her senior years. She lives at the clinic and because veterinary clinics do not take in any walk-in patients at the moment, she happily has the run of the place. We have had updates on Faithful and our girl is doing great and took no time to adjust to her new surroundings. There were concerns about how she would react to the dogs coming into the clinic for their appointments, but Faithful does not pay them any mind. She is also getting laser treatments as necessary to treat her arthritis. Congratulations Faithful, we are so happy for you. Another notable adoption was Michael. Michael was a smoky gray short-haired domestic cat. He was rescued from an abusive home and brought to Burlington Humane. He was trapped in a home with someone who had conviction charges pending against her, including animal cruelty. She had been forbidden to own an animal. Fortunately, Michael was rescued and brought to Burlington Humane. When he arrived, he understandably was very fearful, and he took a long time to trust anyone. Fortunately, he physically only had a few scrapes and bruises. However, the psychological damage was much worse. We had a family come in looking for a family pet, and when they approached Michael, he responded to them immediately. He was adopted that day, and we received an update a few days later. According to the adopters, Michael was the missing puzzle piece in their lives. He warmed up beautifully to his new home and has become playful as a kitten. He loves playing with a laser pointer and a crinkle ball and has become very affectionate, oftentimes reaching out to his new family members for more pets. We at Burlington Humane are amazed at how much he has learned to trust people again and our hearts are overflowing with gratitude and gratefulness to his new adopters. Michael really got a second chance at life and we are very happy with his success. Another honorable mention is Mr. T, who arrived as a stray and spent the first few weeks in one of our foster homes. Our foster volunteer did a wonderful job with him and he was a very spry, happy cat. So we felt it was time for him to come to the shelter so he could find his forever home. However, when he arrived, he shut right down. He became withdrawn, depressed, and angry. It took him a long time before he adjusted to life in the shelter. However, he was just not the same cat. We feared we might have to try him again in a foster home. When a family came along just in the nick of time, it was a family of very understanding and patient people. They wanted to give Mr. T a second chance and understood the time it might take him to come around. Thank you for giving Mr. T the home he deserves. The City of Burlington has a mandatory indoor mask requirement. And as such, all of our volunteers, staff and guests must wear masks at all time while visiting Burlington Humane. All guests are required to bring their own mask. However, we do have reusable masks on hand, which we ask our guests to return at the end of each visit. We also have face shields for those guests who are not able to wear a mask for medical reasons. Are you prepared to help your pet in the event of an accident? What will you do until you can get them to the veterinarians? Burlington Humane is proud to offer Walks and Wags Pet First Aid Course. 
Walks and Wags Pet First Aid are national leaders in pet first aid and have the longest standing pet first aid course in Canada. It has earned the stamp of approval from Animal Wellness, North America's top animal wellness magazine. This hands-on live practical gives you the skills and confidence to deal with illness and emergencies. The 10 hour course deals with how to prevent injuries, early signs of illness and poisoning, bandaging and splinting techniques, emergency medical conditions, choking, artificial respiration and CPR, and much, much more. Upon su successful completion, you'll receive a certificate valid for three years. Our next Pet First Aid courses are February 7th and May 16th. Go to our website at www.burlingtonhumane.ca for more information. Pet First Aid. To find the latest information about events, ways to make a donation, the animals that are up for adoption, and much more, visit our website at www.burlingtonhumane.ca. You can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Be sure to stay in touch and up to date with Burlington Humane. That's it for this episode of Burlington Humane, the podcast of the Burlington Humane Society. I want to thank our guest, Jen Merritt, our Burlington Humane president. Be sure to subscribe to Burlington Humane on iTunes. We are located at 740 Griffith Court in Burlington, Ontario. You can visit our website at www.burlingtonhumane.ca or Give us a call at 905-637-7325. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you for joining us. My name is Doug. We'll see you next time on Burlington Humane. Bye-bye. My society, my society, Burlington Humane is my society.